Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. My name is Adrian Palm and I'm the Dutch ambassador. A warm welcome to you all, especially to the Lord Mayor of Dublin and to the various members of the DELT and the European Parliament, as well as city and council councils. The COVID-19 epidemic has led to a shift in discussion about mobility and cycling all over Europe. And here in Ireland, more people than ever are using their bicycle. This leads to various challenges as people want to use the road safely. And yesterday, here in Dublin, we were once again confronted with the harsh reality how safe it is. Now, in close discussions with Dublin Cycling Campaign, Chambers Ireland, Clonakilty Bike Festival, Cyclist.ie, the Bicycle Mayor Donna Cooney, and the Dutch Cycling Embassy, we got three topics of interest which we'll address uh, in a series of cycling webinars. And the first topic addressed today is bicycle park parking. We have three speakers today. Brendan O'Brien, Head of Technical Services, Environment and Transport of Dublin City Council. Volker Piersma from ProRail in the Netherlands. And Monique Harmsen from Lumingide. They will each speak for about 10 minutes. And after this, we will have the chance to hear questions from you, the audience. Please submit your questions through the chat, not the Q&A function, on your screens. And you can already do that from the start. As we have almost 200 participants from Ireland and elsewhere, please keep those questions brief and include your name and organization you represent. And please note that today's question and answer session, as well as the presentations, are being recorded and that all the presentations as well as your question and answers will be on the record. I would like to thank you all again for joining us today and I look forward to a stimulating and informative discussion and I will now pass the floor over to Councillor Donna Cooney, the bicycle mayor, who will give a brief introductory message. Thank you Donna. Um, Donna, can you hear us? Seems that we have a slight uh, technical problem. Uh, I'm sorry for, uh, for that. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I couldn't unmute myself there. I'll limit, I'll, I'll cut my uh, introduction down, but I'm delighted here to be able to um, also introduce this. And I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, I met, first of all, the ambassador, Adrian Pham, um, at um, a civic reception in uh, Dublin City Council. I had only just become um, uh, a Lord Mayor of, uh, I'd only just become um, uh, city councillor and um, uh, we were having a civic reception for um, the King of the Netherlands, uh, um, Wilhelm Alexander and uh, Queen Maxima and um, he brought along a lovely um, uh, uh, bicycle stand which was on the shape of a green bicycle and afterwards we were talking about um, him in the introduction he said oh I'm giving this because I'm delighted that Dublin City are hosting Velo City and um, with and also that uh, so much increase in cycling in Dublin City and with that success comes the need for more bicycle parking and that really just seeded the idea I think in, in my head and um, afterwards then um, I in February I was oh I met again Adrian at the in Trinity College in June on the night before Velo City and I was being um, inaugurated as the first uh, Dublin bicycle mayor and the 50th in the world 
And um, at that, we also talked about um, bicycling, cycling infrastructure and how, um, you know, you would really like to help and the, the embassy would really like to help us with uh, the experience that you have um, already built in, in, in cycling infrastructure. And, you know, so we talked about how we could um, how we could learn from you and how you could help us. And then in February, I traveled to Amsterdam for the European uh, Bicycle Mare Summit. And um, I met various people over there, um, more De Vere's who'd been in Dublin a few times, obviously. And um, I met um, Pascal as well from the Handshake Project. And I met a lot of people um, and I saw an awful lot of great cycling infrastructure. And um, they were like hotels for bicycles at train stations. They were amazing. I thought, what a thing to have here in Dublin. So when I came back, um, then I had also, um, I said we went then um, Kira McGovern was absolutely brilliant. She got in touch with me. We managed to meet in March uh, 2020 before COVID-19, a physical meeting. We had a coffee together and chatted and then all our meetings afterwards needed to be online. Um, but at, with COVID-19, came a huge increase in cycling and Dublin City started to bring in some infrastructure in really quick um, fix measures due to the COVID-19 team and the mobility team and own Keek and CAO and um, I asked if we could look at um, having a, a multi-story car park Jury Street is in the ownership of Dublin City Council and how we could adapt that into a cycle parking um, and Owen Keegan came back and said he was very positive about that and he said Brendan O'Brien would be the, the man to work on that and he's been doing excellent work with the um, you know quick cycling infrastructure stuff that we'd waited maybe 15-20 years for you know um, Jury Street, the Liffey Street cycling, there's been cycling infrastructure going in in Dublin overnight and it's you know there's such a huge increase in people cycling out my way in the segregated cycleway and with that obviously comes we need a solution in terms of we can't have it all on street uh, all our cycle parking because we need that um, pavement space as well for people walking and physical distancing so i'm absolutely delighted that it has come to this this is our first um webinar and we are having some really good experts speaking and um, who know what they're talking about integrated systems and um, really looking forward to and to see we've got great guests here from you know um, for people that can influence that are working in this area and um, we've everything you know from the politics from MEPs to um, uh, engineers that are will be able to implement uh, these and it'll be great um, cross exchange of ideas I'm really looking forward to the question and answer session and to listening to the experts in this field thank you so much um, to um, the to the embassy and uh, to uh, the Dutch cycling embassy as well who are really you know I really admire their work and they are very influential and thank you very much Okay, um, thanks Donna and thanks Ambassador. I, I think I'm the first presentation, so I'll just try and share my screen and uh, we can um, get started. Um, so hopefully everybody can see that. And uh, we'll just start off with that uh, great green bicycle uh, parking uh, hoop that uh, the Dutch Ambassador was kind enough to give us uh, as a mark of uh, Bello City, uh, which is ordaining the area outside our canteen uh, in the civic offices. So uh, it's been well used over, over the time we've had it. Um, so, just... yeah, so I, I suppose just to talk about cycle parking in Dublin, um, you know, it's part, it's part of our city development plan. Uh, it's part of it to, to consider both uh, off street uh, through the development process to, to ensure that new uh, developments are fully equipped with uh, cycle parking uh, and also to set out standards for the various different um, types of development and the various different things that we should be looking at. Uh, and in specific uh, terms, we wanted to start to provide uh, bicycle parking, you know, to, to, you know, outside libraries, et cetera, churches, et cetera. So that, that was kind of the, the context and, um, you know, the type of, you know, problems we were experiencing in the city. It's not unusual for any city. We, we had um, 
this kind of situation where bicycles were being parked in such a way that they really obstructed the footpath that they uh, caused trip hazards to, to um, pedestrians, to visually impaired, to mobility impaired. So, you know, this is the kind of thing that we're trying to um, mitigate against. Uh, as, as Donna was saying, cycling has, uh, has increased in numbers uh, uh, over the last couple of years in Dublin City um, particularly, and Dublin City then started to look at what we needed to provide. So we knew and we know ourselves that we can provide a limited amount on street because we, we have relatively narrow pavements uh, and we're quite a constrained city centre. Uh, so we know that you know, as we go through this process and as cycling grows more and more, it's the off-street multi-storey um, car parks and off-street cycle parking locations that will eventually be the elements that, that will really provide the, the, the necessary cycling provision. Um, but I suppose, you know, uh, as part of this uh, project and as part of our kind of implementation of cycle parking over the last number of years, we were looking at where we should, where we should put it, uh, how we should put it in. So typical kind of cycle provision that was that was being put in, uh, you know, Sheffield stands uh, outside the civic offices, outside City Hall, um, you know, along streets uh, and also using these these kind of carports as well in various different locations. So try, trying to, to find space was um, quite a considerable challenge in the city uh, and it still is. Um, so some of the kind of uh, innovative ones were to, to make use of some of the cycle hoops and so on that we could put onto a, a existing street furniture. Um, and then we also started to, to move the, uh, towards a covered um, version of the outdoor Sheffield stands as well. Um, but I suppose what really kick-started us was, was the stationist bikes. So, you know, we, we have a very successful station uh, bike system run by Jason Co in Dublin. It's, it, it's been very successful over the years. Um, and as stationist bikes then became, uh, you know, start, start, we started to see in other countries, we were aware of the particular issues, but stationist bikes to us represented an opportunity. So uh, one of the things we did, we decided that we had to regulate these under our bylaws. Um, so rather than allowing them to appear willy-nilly uh, on the streets, because we knew, you know, as I said, we had constrained streets. We already had problems with, with uh, ordinary bicycles. Adding uh, into that mix a large number of, of stationist bikes was not going to be possible. So, you know, one of the things, uh, the bleeper bikes here, we have um, a control of, of on-street uh, bicycle hire bylaws, which we put together in 2017 and started licensing the actual uh, on-street uh, stationist bikes. So we have two stationist bikes uh, operators in Dublin uh, at the moment. And the key element here was that, was that within the bylaws, we had a requirement that they be parked uh, according to our guidelines, which basically means parked to an acceptable bicycle stand. Um, so while this is a very sensible thing to put in, uh, it obviously caused us quite a bit of alarm because we knew we didn't have enough um, cycle stands. So, um, so what we started to do uh, was, you know, to, to look for how we'd have this situation. So this is the bleeper bikes, uh, which are the first ones uh, out of the block. Uh, how we'd provide enough cycle facilities, on-street cycle facilities, that uh, they could be parked legally by people so that we weren't ending up removing it uh, and causing, if you like, uh, causing a problem to the operators by our failure to actually provide sufficient uh, cycle parking in the city. So we began, we, we had been installing batches of, of, of stands over the years, but, but really by in 2018, we really decided we'd start to move this up a serious level. Um, so we started to, to look to put in about four and a half thousand cycle stands, giving us, uh, you know, 9,000 cycle spaces. Um, and this goes up to, to batch 13, which got delayed by COVID, but I've just signed off on batch 15, which is another um, bunch of, of cycle stands. So even with uh, COVID interrupting us, uh, we've put in around 700 cycle stands this year. So we're, we're you know, well on target to, to, to hit the, um, the 4,000. I would say that one of the prime drivers of this was to make sure that we could roll out the, the stationist bikes. And in particular, that we didn't just concentrate on the city centre, which is where we had been mainly concentrating before, but actually took into account that the stationist bikes actually in Dublin act as a, a you know, a complementary measure to our station bikes. So they tend to be further out in the other, in the outer suburbs where we don't see, our, where we don't have our station bikes. And in the city, then they tend to swap over. So, 
as space became more and more difficult to find, uh, we did make the decision to remove on-street parking. So we've removed um, quite a quantum of on-street parking in uh, various different locations and replaced them with, uh, with Sheffield stands. Uh, the on-street parking, replacing on-street parking has, has a number of, of, of benefits in one sense in, in that it leaves the footpath uh, clear so we're, we're not uh, taking away any space for pedestrians. and. In the light of what we've learned with COVID, this has become even more valuable that, that we, we leave footpath space as much as possible alone or in, or in fact widen it as we've done in a number of cases. Um, however, you know, taking out cycle spaces or taking out parking spaces to provide cycling, it does generate a lot of opposition. We have complaints from businesses. We also have to, to, as I say, think about doctor's bikes. We have to try and find some space for disabled cycle parking and cargo bikes. Um, and this was a case in point to uh, one of our suburbs where um, our workmen who were actually putting in these stands were actually threatened and we had to call the police to actually um, defuse the situation. So generated quite a lot of uh, angst and, uh, you know, it's not a, it sounds like an easy thing to do, you know, remove some of the parking, you know, if you have 20 spaces, remove two, you know, put in space for 20 cyclists, uh, 20 bicycles, but in actual fact, it, it, it can drive um, a lot of opposition, a lot of local opposition. Um, however, despite that, uh, you know, we, we've really extended out uh, in the Dublin city area. So starting off, as I say, with the bigger concentration of stands in, in the city centre, as you can see, we've been spreading out um, really as the stationless bikes have, have, um, have been rolled out. Um, you know, and the, the latest ones, Moby, the, the e-bikes, you know, again, generate some issues for us because of the further range. Um, so again, we'll have far more um, will have far more uh, parking further out. Drury Street Car Park then, that was opened in, um, Drury Street Car Park is in DCC ownership. So there was a floor of it given up to, to cycle parking. We had a small parking space before this. We, we greatly expanded it, opened this up in June, 2018. So 332 bike parking spaces, room for cargo bikes. And we're in discussion with a number of other car parks to provide cycle facilities in the city center. Um, during COVID, we, we changed from our, from our uh, Sheffield stands to, to a much more rapid deployment stand. Uh, we used some of our cycle hooks to aid our colleagues in the OPW in the Botanic Gardens who had problems with cycle parking. And as Donna knows, we've been providing uh, cycle parking to various schools as well. One of the key points that we're anxious to learn about is we have a metro uh, in planning at the moment. Uh, you know, so we're looking at it in uh, ourselves and TI in that we have an, uh, an outer area, a middle area, and then a city, city center area and how we provide, what quantum of cycle parking we provide there. Um, you know, so looking at isochromes where people walk, but the footprint of stations is quite small. So we'll have to think about how we do it in mix of stations and in surrounding areas. So, you know, as we, as we move on, uh, you know, we are looking at the off street uh, provisions. We're looking at around the Metro uh, link. We're looking at how, you know, maybe developments around areas there could be provisioned with cycle parking, which is publicly accessible. Um, so in recap, we're, we're rolling out quite, quite, a, quite a large number on the street, but we know we have to get to a much more substantial off street component. So thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I have uh, unfortunately just got off of the phone with Folkert, who's having some technical issues on the other side. Um, so I'm going to ask that uh, Monique step in and provide her presentation. Uh, and then we're trying to get Folkert's slide to his colleague Bart so that he can still uh, give a talk. So I'm going to hand the floor over to Monique uh, and uh, she can give her presentation. Uh, there you are. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Chris. I'll just uh, share my screen with you.
Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, again, Volker is going to uh, talk to you about how ProRail as a Dutch uh, national organization is going to tackle bicycle parking challenges uh, in order to get people to use their bicycle to get to and from the station. Um, I am from the company called LumiGuide Smart Mobility Solutions. Uh, my name is Monique Harmson. And we at LumiGuide, we are one of the companies that supply the technology that facilitates these first and last mile journeys. And our focus is on smart bicycle parking management, um, which includes the so-called um, bicycle detection and route information systems. Well, let's start at the beginning. Uh, of course, we all know that cycling cities are pleasant cities. They create more public space they provide easy transportation, and they save you time. But if you want people to cycle, the whole journey from A to B has to be good. And that is why it's important to consider infrastructure, parking, and behavior together. You cannot really deal with them separately. Um, I would like to focus a little bit more on the parking side of things in my talk, and on how technology can help manage this. Well, the Technical University of Delft in the Netherlands found in one of their studies that secure parking facilities increase the transit catchment area by 234 meters. They indicate that integration of bicycle and transit can increase catchment areas of transit compared with walking and thus provide better competition to non-sustainable modes of transport. Well, the Dutch have really taken this into their stride this is what we in Holland are uh, infamous for, uh, very large and bright bicycle parking facilities for thousands upon thousands of bicycles, often built under architecture and always in the direct vicinity of the larger stations. When, if we can't go under the ground with our parking uh, garages for bicycles, we go under the water. On the upper left-hand corner of your screen, you can see an example of what they're going to be building in Amsterdam. This is behind the central station and a uh, very large bicycle parking facilities being built there under the water. Uh, same thing happens uh, at the front side of the station, again, under the water because we just don't have enough space uh, anymore. All new bicycle parking facilities in the Netherlands, especially the big ones, are equipped with uh, what we call state-of-the-art bicycle parking management uh, technology. Often these link uh, payment and reservation systems to so-called bicycle detection. Now this latter technology, which we at LumiGuide offer, ensures users um, ensures users to know where and how many parking spaces are still available for them. At the same time, stakeholders receive management information on how these facilities are being used, um, what type of users are, are going to these facilities, etc. And this brings the bicycle on the same level as the car when it comes to considering it as a serious mode of transport. Oh, by the way, this strong emphasis on modern bicycle parking infrastructure in the Netherlands uh, that is on par with car parking brings its own problems. Um, if you look at the, the right hand side uh, of the screen, you see a car drive, trying to drive into the, uh, largest car, uh, the largest bicycle parking facility in the Netherlands, in Utrecht, because the infrastructure is that good that it's comparable to that for cars. So it's not all, uh, uh, all good uh, in that respect. All these large uh, facilities for bicycle parking, like the one you see here, uh, they're all uh, equipped with a so-called bicycle detection system. Um, not just the large ones, but also quite a few smaller ones. And the LumiGuide system uh, that offers this works with camera sensors uh, that uh, look at the different individual bicycle parking stands and the AI algorithm that we developed, so artificial intelligence, we use that to identify available parking spots and we use it to gather information about parking duration, facility usage, etc. Well, the information on available parking spaces can then be sent to 
for instance, digital signs in the parking facility itself or at the entrance to show uh, how many parking spaces are still available, or to digital signs in the street, um, or to a mobile app, as you can see on the next slide. This is the city of Utrecht, uh, which was the first city in the world to have a bicycle route information system supplied by Lumiguide. And there are around 26 of these poles with digital signs uh, scattered along the busy cycling routes, for instance, to the station, to the university, to the main shopping areas. Uh, so cyclists can uh, use these signs to know exactly where they can still find a place to park their bicycle. So in this sense, it's really bringing the bicycle up to par with the car. We don't just supply user information, uh, but a system like ours also generates overall data on the usage of the parking facility. And we even can give you information down to the level of the individually parked bicycle. Like how long has it been parked there? Has it been there for too long? Uh, did the user pay for it? That all these types of things we can generate. But this might all be very impressive and it might still seem a little bit far away from the situation currently in Ireland. But of course, bicycle parking in the Netherlands didn't really start out like this. We started out by taking small baby steps with small scale local parking. And this is still something we focus on quite a lot. So what we see here are several small scale solutions uh, for bike parking. On the le upper left hand corner, we see a pop up bicycle parking stand taking the space of one parked car. So it's on wheels, but it's just to show people that um, yeah, you can use car parking spaces in a different way as well. Um, we see bus stop cycle parking to encourage people to take the public transport to go to the station areas. And we see some examples of small secure parking hubs in residential areas or business uh, districts. And technology can also play a role here, uh, for instance, by offering entrance systems, monitoring, reservation options, or a combination of these technologies. So different ways where uh, in the Netherlands we use technology to facilitate these things. Other ways to use low tech applications to facilitate parking are for instance, using light projections to indicate pop-up parking spaces at nighttime for bicycle parking, or by monitoring these pop-up parking spaces with a mobile application on handheld devices for the uh, munis municipality staff. So the real-time occupancy data can be shared with users via the municipal website, digital signs, or a mobile app. A lesson learned in the Netherlands uh, basically is build it and they'll come. It starts with a mindset change, of course, uh, and then infrastructure parking and behavior will follow. And of course, we would be more than happy to assist you uh, in this journey. Um, thank you very much for your attention. I'm sure you will have some questions on the topics we discussed and hopefully Folkert can uh, uh, tell you a lot more about um, how ProRail is going about dealing with these issues. So I will just uh, hand over the reins again to the Dutch Cycling Embassy um, so they can take over. Thank you very much. Thanks, Monique. Yes, so we are going to have uh, Folkert's colleague, uh, Bart Hofsink, present in his place. I believe he has the slides and is ready to go. So I'm just going to hand over the floor. Perfect. Bart. I'm trying to share my screen. I think it's you all see my screen now. Um, yes, it was. You can all hear me now because I'm I have doubts if it really is so. Um, 
Look. Ah, thank you. Uh, you guys all can hear me. That's nice. Um, but I think my present, I can't see my presentation right now. It's not very. Um, Excuse me, I'm trying again. I think I'll have to do it quick then because I can't see my own presentation. Oh, here it is, I think. Um, Cycling and public transport in the Netherlands, it's a great combination. Uh, it was planned for Volker Pierce, where my colleague would give the presentation, but he's facing some diff uh, technical problems. Uh, so uh, I'm stepping in for him. Um, I hope now you see the next slide. Can I please have a confirmation on that? Oh, now I can't see the chat anymore. It's drama. Uh, I hope you can see the uh, next slide. It's, uh, it's a slide about the Netherlands. Uh, we have uh, over 17 million inha inhabitants. Uh, we have 22 million bicycles. So more bicycles than, uh, than inhabitants. Um, about 30% of all journeys go by bike in the Netherlands. Uh, we have 400 railway stations and 46% of people cycle to the train station and 40% of the people cycled from the train station. Um, why we cycle so much in the Netherlands? It's efficient, it's easy, it's fast, it's healthy, it's sustainable, it's social, it's cheap, but um, it's also our cu culture, it's uh, our identity and uh, the Netherlands is flat. That, uh, that helps a lot. Um, uh, what kind of company is ProRail? ProRail is managing the rail infrastructure, uh, infrastructure in the Netherlands. Uh, here are some numbers about, uh, uh, about uh, the, the railway track in, uh, in the Netherlands. And um, managing the infrastructure also means uh, managing bicycle park facilities at all the 400 uh, railway stations in the Netherlands. Um, then the bicycle parking program. Uh, we have a bicycle parking program. It was commissioned by the Ministry of Infrastructure and uh, Water Management. It started in 1999 and uh, it uh, involved a 100% investment cost by the ministry for expanding uh, uh, the capacity of uh, bicycle parking facilities. Uh, as of 2008, uh, 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 local co-financing was required uh, by the ministry. Um, and what it was, it, uh, uh, like I uh, mentioned before, uh, the aim was to improve bicycle use by train travelers. Um, and the state is in 2020. Right now, we uh, created over 500,000 500, places uh, uh, at, uh, 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 at the train stations in the Netherlands. And we already spent about 500 million euros. But the most important thing is, uh, by doing this, the uh, uh, bicycle use to go to the station increased from 30% to almost 50%. Um, what is important for the success uh, for, uh, uh, for the combination of cycling and public transport? Um, one of the main thing is uh, we, you need to have a good functioning public transport system with a frequent timetable, uh, sufficient seats in the train and bus, and pleasant railway or bus stations, and also safe infrastructure for cyclists, good bicycle parking facilities at stations, know what is important to the traveler, and organize a good bike rental system for the last mile. What is important to the traveler? What do cyclists like the best? 
the shortest and quickest route from A to B, and as close as possible to B, to park your, to park your bicycle as close as possible uh, to B, to your destination. On some stations, that really worked out very well, as you can see in this picture. The bike parking facility is, is next to the platform. Um, how do cyclists want to park? First of all, they want to do it quickly and they want to do it free of charge. And secondly, safe, dry, and in a pleasant setting. Uh, and we did an investigation and in the Netherlands, only 50% of all cyclists choose to pay for guarded parking. The rest of the uh, of of all cyclists want to park uh, free, quickly, free of charge. Um, what kind of uh, facilities do we offer to cyclists um, uh, at at smaller stations? We offer uh, um, um, bicycle parking on the street with uh, um, um, a rooftop above it, so it is mostly dry. Um, also, for people with uh, uh, more expensive bikes or something, we offer lockers. People can uh, hire a locker and uh, they can put their bike into a locker if they are afraid of uh, it's being stolen or something, which is uh, unfortunately a problem in the Netherlands. Bikes are often stolen. Um, we also have uh, um, uh, bike parking facilities uh, with, um, let's say, um, two floors. Uh, you can uh, put your bike into the uh, upper, uh, upper layer as well. So you can, uh, uh, you can have twice as much bikes parked on the same area. But also we have larger stations, Monique mentioned them before, with uh, parking facilities under, uh, under the station, as you can see here. This was one of the first uh, which was realized uh, uh, under the program in the, uh, the city of Zutphen. Uh, and also we uh, design uh, stations uh, um, specifically uh, with the... Um, uh, the, the the bike parking facility as a part as a part of the station, not not uh, a, a, um, uh, um, uh, not a bike parking facility which is uh, not connected not connected to the station, but in this uh, specific um, uh, in this specific station, you can uh, park your bike under the platforms. It's only you have to only get up the stairs and then you're on the platform. As you can see here, this is uh, the same station. Again, this is the same station. And uh, this is also Monique uh, just showed. This is uh, um, the largest uh, bike parking facility in the world still, I think. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's I think uh, the Netherlands is almost the only country in the world uh, uh, who needs, uh, which needs so much, uh, so so big, uh, such a big facility. Um, what kind of concepts do we have? We have the detection and arrest system. Monique also mentioned about it, uh, and we have a new parking regime in the. Uh, guarded uh, uh, bike park facilities, uh, the first 24 hours free of charge. And uh, we uh, see uh, uh, a big increase uh, in parking in uh, the guarded uh, facilities because uh, at first it was uh, a guarded, uh, sorry, it, um, it was not free of, uh, it was uh, not free of charge. You had to pay from the first hour you uh, you were parking there. And uh, since it, uh, we introduced the regime first 24 hours free of charge, um, it's, uh, became, uh, they became very popular. And we also have a new self-service concept. 
uh, it's a guarded concept, but, uh, but without uh, uh, people actually guarding uh, the, the, um, the bike parking facility. And um, we changed from uh, like a prison look uh, to a more friendly and open and transparent uh, entrance, as you can see by the use of uh, all the glass. Uh, and uh, also our uh, carrier, in the, the main carrier in the Netherlands, the, the Nederlandse Spoorwegen, NS, uh, has, um, a, uh, has the OV Fiets, which is a, um, um, a re car rental system for the last mile. And uh, it has become, uh, it has grown massively. As you can see, uh, in 2010, they were having 750,000 uh, rides per day, and now they are at uh, 5.2 million rides. Uh, uh, in, uh, the, in that was in 2019. What's an important conclusion? Um, what we uh, have. Uh, what what we see what we saw in the Netherlands that a good range of bike and park facilities creates extra use. If people see I can park my bike safe, I can uh, park my bike uh, and it's it still it, it still is dry when I pick it up after a rainy day, it creates extra use. So um, that's very good to see because and and that's also uh, you can we we saw it in the numbers by uh, with the increasing number of thirty percent uh, uh, people going uh, by bike to the train to fifty percent right now. And our advice: think as a cyclist, even better, cycle yourself. Make the cyclist happy. Be creative. Do do not accept when people say things are impossible. Cooperate with all stakeholders, check all the costs on time, not only the investments, and keep the end uh, in mind, a nicer world for everybody. And uh, here are our uh, contact details. And I, uh, uh, we would like to see your questions in the, um, in the, um, uh, in, in the question uh, and answer, and I'll give the, I hope I can give the Thanks, Bart. I've, floor I've, to you. Yeah, I've got it from here. Okay, uh, very good. Appreciate, really appreciate you filling in for Falkert. I realized that was not easy. Um, the, the slides were not visible or advanced. Oh, not visible. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. We, will, uh, we will distribute PDFs of yep. uh, each of the slide decks amongst the attendees, so yep. you can revisit the, the visual uh, aspect of this presentation. So I'm going to hand the floor back over to Ambassador Palm to uh, continue with the Q&A. And we've got about, uh, well, 17 minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Chris. Um, and thank you all to the audience for listening. I'm sorry for the inconvenience with the, the slides and the uh, and which it will be will shared with you all. Um, I, I, I received a large number of questions, uh, which you all could see in the in the chat as well. I think there's uh, three main categories. One has to do with the issue of mentality. Um, what uh, what change of mentality is there? To what extent is there uh, is, is is the government leading and 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 basically um, putting in changes, not at the request of people, but to, to, to push in a certain direction. Um, second, the question, kind of questions are more on the technical facilities. Um, I, I read the question from, uh, from Karen Powell, and maybe Brandon, you can ask those questions. Uh, for example, are there uh, charging uh, points for electrical bikes? Uh, is there a maintenance program for the bike repair stations? And um, where do you intend uh, to, to, to put all the, uh, the, the stations? Um, um, and um, the, um, the, the mentality thing is, 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 is basically through three things. One is um, 
the, the traffic calming measures, maybe you can say something on that, uh, Brendan, as well. Um, they tend to be uh, reactive more than uh, proactive, says uh, Sebastian Venken. Uh, this is contrary to the approach in the Netherlands and contrary to good street planning. Considering uh, traffic calming can significantly enhance a safe and friendly environment for active travelers. And why does this mentality exist in Dublin? What is possibly being done uh, to change this? Uh, and, and linked to that, I guess the question uh, from, uh, from Mr. Hackett uh, from uh, uh, Green Schools. Any thoughts on changing the green carport design to a bike port? I think it's time to break the association between bike uh, parking and car parking. The current carport design consistently reinforces the ideas that cars are priority within our cities. Um, Brian, can I give you the floor on, 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 on those questions uh, as a start? And then maybe later on our Dutch guests can, can reply on the mentality thing and how we change the mentality of people in general in the Netherlands. Okay, sorry, I'm, uh, Ambassador. Yeah, I was just uh, on mute there. So, um, just I, I guess there was a couple of questions. Um, just one or two of the specific ones for the Moby bikes. No, we don't provide charging. They they have a replacement pack. Um, Dury Street does have a maintenance um, regime. Um, so, uh, whatever the particular issue is there, I'll get somebody to look at it. Um, I, I think the the issue of that we're making proactive rather than reactive. I'm not completely sure I understand the question, um, but I think um, one of the things we should emphasize is that uh, as we go through this period of change and trying to uh, turn the city into a far more traffic calmed and into a far more um, conducive city to, to cycling, to walking, uh, the opposition to it and the difficulties encountered by the um, kind of way the city has been built over the last number of years and just the way the city operates is is quite considerable and uh, you know as we're rolling out the various different interventions to do with COVID uh, it's quite astonishing how much um, resistance there is to even the simplest change so uh, you know we're we are uh, trying to move in that direction and we're you know we're quite uh, anxious to learn from how people have managed it in the past, but I should not um, let anybody underestimate the, the sheer uh, opposition, hostility and stress that causes to, to, to my staff who are trying to undertake this, uh, these measures. So, and very simple things. The example I showed you where we have to call the, the police to, to protect the workmen who are putting in cycle stands is not actually that isolated. We had an instant, even when we were trying to put in some COVID measures for cycle, for um, social distancing where, you know, um, people actually remove them, uh, illegally remove them. So, um, so I would say that, you know, some, sometimes uh, we have to be careful that we're not in an echo chamber and uh, that we are actually trying to bring along a lot of people with, the, with these measures. Um, so, you know, we, we are given the opportunity with a lot of the public transport investment that hopefully will still may be made over the next number of years, particularly the, the bus connects, the Metrolink and the Dart Plus to actually get a lot of these things right. Uh, and that's really what we're, uh, what we aim to, to do. And so it's, it's really useful for us to see what, um, what has already been done and what sets an example for us. I'll hand it back to you. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, I think there's a, a number of, of questions indeed on the, on the, on the mentality issue. Which, uh, which, which I think would be actually good to close off the session and see how, how we can change mentality, what we can do, to, uh, do on that. Um, a number of people have asked questions on the, the modular aspects of, of travel. Uh, and um, as um, 
as, as I think was uh, came clear from the uh, presentations, the Netherlands, how important actually the, the link between trains and bicycles is. Now, in Ireland, uh, here in Dublin, um, buses are the main tra means of, of transportation. Um, uh, so that's that's that that is something where we have to look at it uh, differently. Kevin Carter said uh, uh, Dublin's public transport is largely bus-based. We see examples of bikes being taken on buses in North America. Uh, what's the opinion in the Netherlands of bikes on buses? Uh, and I must say, I've hardly ever seen uh, bikes on buses myself. And we already see that trains can facilitate this, but less so buses, trams, and metro. And that's a similar question that came forward all the way from, uh, from Germany, uh, from Victor Goebel, uh, from the city of Munich, who said, good bike parking infrastructure at your stations. But another strategy is allowing bikes in the vehicles of public transport, mainly likely only off uh, peak hours. Which capacity in the trains, trams, buses do you provide for that purpose? And what's the foreseen for the off peak hours? And that may be also something for, for you, Brandon, to, to react upon how you see the, the, um, the modular approach uh, and, and not just when it comes to, uh, to, bike, station, uh, to bike parking at the, at the new metro stations where you can include it, but also in the current uh, facilities uh, at the DAR stations, etc. Yeah, and and uh, I I completely agree with that 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 point, and I suppose it goes back to to something I said that we're we're dealing in some ways with what was what was built. So the DAR treaty was conceived really in the seventies, uh, and uh, you know, it, it, a, a bit like the early uh, Lewis lines, they didn't actually include any cycle parking with them, uh, and you know the the change now, particularly with the next batch of of Lewis lines, is very much. To include cycling and to include cycling routes, so the the one to Finglas in particular uh, will will be far more taking it as as a complete, as you say, modular system. So, you know, yes, you're com you know people are completely correct. We do rely on the bus, to, uh, you know, and the, you know putting buses or putting bikes on our, our buses is not going to be possible. So it's really about how do we um, how do we uh, encourage people to cycle to the public transport and I suppose that's why the stationless bikes um, you know that we could roll out relatively rapidly across the city ha have proved so successful and it's one of the items that we want to to increasingly do is to is to have that uh, integration so you know cycle stands near bus stops uh, encouraging people to to use them and, and again as part of the whole bus connects project that'll be one of the things that we'll be trying to to roll out um but you know a, 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 again there, there are some good examples now increasingly of of people wanting to convert what was the or car parks into cycle spaces um uh, we're now in a stage where we may be at a slight tipping point in that we're now getting private car parks coming to us wanting to put cycle facilities in. Now, there's various different issues. They, they certainly don't want to do it for free, but at least uh, we're now in a position where they are starting to think uh, that they really need to fill the spaces in their car parks and doing it with cycle parking uh, is becoming more and more of a possibility. So that's quite a, a good uh, sign, I think, in the city center of the, the kind of change uh, and the less reliance on, on, on cars. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brendan. And maybe um, from the from the Dutch perspective, um, we, we can get some information on how how there it is perceived, and maybe also how the whole mentality changed towards that multimodular system uh, came around, um, and and how can we ensure that that is then also something that we can learn here in Ireland? Is it something that uh, that? Uh, that uh, that uh, Monique uh, or, or uh, you you could say something about. I don't know whether Folkert is already back online or not. Yeah, maybe I can uh, try to uh, to talk a little bit about that. Um, when we look at the mentality changes that occurred in the Netherlands when it comes to cycling uh, in general. Um, we saw that in the 1970s, upwards to the 1970s, cycling was uh, a little bit discouraged. So we saw the, the numbers going down. And in the 70s, with the 
Um, I think especially the number of children being killed in traffic by cars, that was a big contributing factor. Uh, coupled with the old oil crisis where cars were just, uh, well, people were uh, not really encouraged to use it anymore. Um, we saw that there was a whole grassroots uh, movement coming up uh, where people um, decided to use tact tactical urbanism to, for instance, create their own cycle paths, um, take matters into their own hands. There were big protests um, really um, trying to move governments and municipal governments to uh, acknowledging the, the bicycle as a safe and healthy way of moving about in the city. Um, so that whole bottom-up movement led to um, a governmental approach or a change in the governmental approach where uh, there was a combination of the, the, the people really wanting change and then the government taking top-down measures to facilitate this change. So that is what brought along the, the huge cycling numbers in the Netherlands. And then, of course, we already had a focus on public transport. Um, a very dense um, network of uh, public transport um, uh, in, in terms of trains, buses, etc. Um, but when we look at the current situation, I think in the Netherlands, it's quite common to have even two or three bicycles per person. So you would have your um, very expensive e-bike, for instance, to go on uh, hiking tours. And then you have your work bike, which is basically a cheap one knockoff version that you could just park at the station uh, where you leave and then you have another bike at the station where you arrive. So there's not really any need to bring your bicycle on the public transport that much. So it's a different way of, of uh, thinking about this and maybe Bart, uh, I see you nodding, uh, maybe you have something to add as well. I can try and give you the, uh, the floor. Uh, I think you're. I think you're completely oh, right. That, oh that's that's it, and, and that's also one of the uh, problems we're facing with our bike park facilities because people do have their second bike parked in our facility yeah. for free, and it's taking a place yeah. uh, for over the weekend uh, or uh, over the overnight, and um, um, that's one of the reasons we sometimes have to. Uh, to, to build extra, capaci uh, extra capacity. Yeah. So for, for us, uh, uh, like I mentioned, uh, the OVA feeds, the rental bike system, is, uh, would be a good replacement uh, for that. Yeah. For that I program. think in the Netherlands we can see, or we can say that up to 20% of all the uh, bicycle parking in the vicinity of the stations is abandoned bicycles. So they, these also take up a lot of space. And um, if you look at the building cost of these uh, fancy uh, architectural uh, bicycle parking uh, facilities, that's just not a good thing, not a good development. Not at all. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for, for these observations from the Netherlands. Um, there's a lot of comments in the, in the chat area and also useful suggestions, questions to each other, which I strongly recommend that you, that you all read very carefully. Um, looking at the clock, I think there's, there's uh, one or two more questions that, that we could, uh, um, could, could answer um, or could have answered by you. Um, and I, I find a very relevant question, the one from Donna Cooney, from our bicycle uh, ambassador, who asked, uh, or remarks, the huge investment that is now available with one million a day on cycling and walking, how do we make sure that this is well spent to benefit the people of all abilities, cycling and livable communities? And I think this is something, um, uh, the, uh, when, I, uh, when I visited uh, Don Leary last Friday um, and, and, and the people there told me how much a, a car uh, lane costs and how much a bike lane costs, um, you start, suddenly start realizing that uh, for some one million a day may not sound that much, but you can actually do quite a bit. And the question is how to make the best use of that. Um, this is of course something that is more for politicians and for uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the local, uh, the, the, the city and the county councils to, to discuss. But I think it's a very valid question. 
and uh, Brandon, as you have spent a lot of money recently on it, how do you look at that? How can we ensure that the money is, is well spent and, and uh, properly accounted for? Um, well, um, I'd like to say I haven't actually spent a lot of money in recent year. COVID mobility measures have been relatively cheap compared to our permanent infrastructure. Uh, and I guess it's a, it's a kind of contrast between, we, we obviously opened Royal Canal phase two, which is quite a, uh, quite a structure. Um, and uh, you know, relatively speaking, quite expensive, but needed, absolutely needed in that area. So, going from a position of of not spending a lot to to a position where potentially money no longer becomes as much of an object, the, there are a number of issues. Um, you know, there's the the kind of staff issues, there's the project issues, there's the planning issues, um, and I I really think that what we need to do is, is actually build on, on what we've done uh, over the last while, which is to, to show that we can roll out some of these measures quite quickly and simply uh, and you know, develop a two-track approach where we're doing the quite big infrastructure projects which are needed, um, but at the same time, rather than just be rolling out big infrastructure projects, which can take quite a, a length of time with our planning systems to actually get through, but to also side by side with that, uh, to, to very much be looking at more qu quicker deployment uh, measures. And I, th I think there is you know, a, a validity in saying that if you make it uh, safe, you'll get more people cycling. Um, there's an interesting thing at the moment which is happening in that our commuting cyclists have disappeared virtually from the city uh, because of COVID and because um, I guess our, maybe our commuting cyclists were all the people who work in tech and finance and uh, have been working from home. So it's a peculiar thing that at the moment our leisure cyclists are up, our commuting cyclists are way down. Um, so we're building infrastructure that really is going to be there for when people start to return to work rather than uh, perhaps people who are there just at the moment. But it's, it's quite a challenge to, to, to do that. Uh, and that's why these webinars uh, are quite useful for us to, to have a look at what uh, other people are doing. Um, I, I think as well, you know, it's important for us to say that, uh, you know, without the enthusiasm of other people who want to see these changes happen, we will not see these changes happen. Uh, and so I'd urge everybody who's enthusiastic about this to make themselves known, to make their voices represented. Um, I mean, on a personal level, I was quite disappointed that our 30 kph proposal met with so little positive response um, and actually met with more negative response. So very often when pe people think that they, if they agree with something, they don't actually contribute to the process. And so I'd really urge you to all to contribute to the process. If you agree with something, go out of your way to contribute to it. Don't just say that's fine. I'll, I'll be glad to use it when, uh, when it's built. Okay, thank you very much, Brandon. And, and with that, I'm, I'm looking at the, at the clock and it says that it's a few minutes past two. Um, that means that unfortunately we have to close this session. Um, I would like to thank uh, our, our three speakers uh, uh, very much for their contributions. I would like to thank the audience uh, very much uh, for all the uh, very interesting questions that they put forward. There's one question that I will take forward to next sessions, and uh, that is from uh, Martina Kananen, who says, bike grants are which are accessible to all would be helpful. The cycle to work scheme is only for pay workers, so huge cohorts, etc., etc. Uh, don't have financial support to own high quality bikes. Um, the next session in two weeks time will be about what companies can do. And uh, with that, I think we will automatically also get to the question of how to make um, cycling affordable for all. Um, with that, I would like to, to thank you. Um, I hope to see you uh, the next time in two weeks time. I would like to apologize for the technical um, uh, problems that we've had. Uh, this is the first one for us as embassy, so please uh, forgive us for that. Um, thanks to the Dutch Cycling Embassy for, for organizing it all uh, together with, uh, with, with all the people who participated today. And I, um, I will say we will make sure that you get the slides um, that were presented so that you can use them. And please also use all the comments in the chats, etc in making sure that um, cycling is, is further promoted here in Ireland and elsewhere, because I saw that we have people from Denmark 
um, uh, Cyprus, uh, Germany, Italy, um, all over the world. And I think that's also what makes this such a great uh, instrument. It's really uh, one big cycling community here and meeting together on Zoom. Thank you all and have a very good day and hope to see you in two weeks time. Thank you.